be the light. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with some wonderful leaders in my time, and, and one of the things I, I noticed, part of the positive psychology focus was this, don't just study who screwed up, don't just study why some leaders are terrible, why some leaders are making all the mistakes, but study the ones that are doing well. And I started to liken it to house plants. At the time I had this big, this big lily that I had to rotate every week. It would grow toward the window, and then I'd have to turn the pot. And then a couple days later, it would start to move over. And it dawned on me that no one has to teach that lily how to grow toward the light. It just naturally does. And if you're a positive leader, you don't have to ask your people to follow you. You just have to be who you are, and you will naturally attract them just as plants are attracted toward the daylight. If nothing else, you being engaged with what you do, and you taking care of yourself, by you taking two things simple from this list and saying three times, at the end of the day, I'm going to come up with three things that I loved about my day. Three things I'm excited about, three things that went really well. And if you find a reason to laugh each day, you yourself will be more engaged. And I've been to too many management workshops where the focus was, take these simple tricks and now go back and manipulate your people to get them to do more work. And that's not what engagement's about. Engagement is like not like the parent with a, a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other telling his little kids, if I ever catch you smoking or drinking, I'll give you a lick of them. No, engagement is follow me not with my words, but follow me by my actions, by my laughter, by my happiness, by my excitement. I'll show you how to get into the flow because I'm going to give you a reason to get there yourself. So you want to have four positives for every one correction. And when you're dealing with a volatile, highly changing environment, that ratio needs to be more like 12 to 1. If you want to get more out of people at work, you don't have to not talk. But when you do talk, you need to find things that you're grateful for and you're praising them for. Because that's what releases something called flow. What is the flow? When you're in the flow, you're in the zone. Have you ever gotten into the zone where you were so focused you lost track of time? That you forgot that you were hungry? That you spaced off every other thing? Now, this is something we're probably all common of. It's all common to us. You have a terrible cold, you're congested, your nose is running, you, you talk like this. But then your favorite TV show comes on. And all of a sudden, for the first 10 minutes, in between the commercials, you don't have a cold anymore, do you? You still do, but you're in the flow, see? Because your mind is not able to, it's like when they say you can't keep your eyes open when you sneeze. You can't focus on how miserable you are when you're not miserable. You can't focus on your misery when you're happy. That's what's being in the flow. To get your employees into that state of the flow where, and I'm not talking about fake artificial positive reinforcement. Now think of the toddler. You're trying to potty train the toddler, right? So you say, okay, every time you go by yourself, I'm going to give you an m, &M. We expect to do that. Why? Because they're new in the job. They haven't deformed mastery yet. When they do it, we give them the m, &M and we do it gratefully. Now, we don't have to keep that up for the same things at work every day. Otherwise, think about it with a teenager. You know, if a 16-year-old, you have friends over, the teenager comes down the stairs and says, Mom, I just went pee. Can I have an m, &M? No, that's not the expectation. Nor should it be something at work where we're giving people false praise for things they don't deserve. But if we want to get people in the flow, it could be nothing more than looking at them and saying, You got it. You're doing it. Keep it up. That's what we do. Here's some things that you all have in common. You your employees, your boss, your customers, when it comes to engagement, all of you want some sort of result, correct? Maybe different results, but you all want results. I think the other thing you want is, you all want to feel great at the end of the day. You want to have a little spring in your step. I want to just touch on this briefly. You know what your boss wants. You know what results specifically your boss wants. You've heard the concept of managing up, or even sucking up. That's not what this is about. This is about going out of the way and making sure that your boss has an avenue to appreciate your coworkers and your employees when they're doing things that matter to the boss. Many times the boss doesn't know. And I've heard this as a barrier for many leaders is that my boss doesn't engage me so I can't engage my employees and that's not true. Um, I instituted some pretty big sweeping engagement programs in different companies and one of them started with finding out if the senior vice president would be willing to take the time once a week to sign thank you cards once they understood what the employees underneath them were doing to get results. What my boss cared most about was customer service. So I would have a list of saying, here are the people who got outstanding customer service results. Now, even a boss who might say, I don't care about the people side, that's not the business, but if you talk in the language that the boss cares about, getting the results the boss cares about, all you're doing is you're providing an avenue for that boss to say, hey, Sally Sue, you did a fantastic job. 
that attorneys have a 3.6 times more likelihood of a depressive episode in their lifetime than any other profession. 3.6 times the risk. Now, how many of you know attorneys? Does that make sense to you? Well, it didn't make sense to me. I went out and started researching it, and I, and I found a research out of California that said this. It said not only that, but they're also much more likely to have substance abuse problems. They're much more likely to be depressed. And in the state of California, it is the highest professions with suicide rates. I thought it was dentist. <laughs> if I were a dentist, I would have killed myself years ago. I mean, I thought about living in someone's mouth, but you know, whatever. We all have our things. But the attorney suicide rate was out, of, out and that said that stress, heart attack from stress was the number one cause of attorney death. This is what got me thinking. So the researcher, Sean, said this. If you think about a profession where these people have higher educations, they have higher income levels, and they have higher status, why in the world would these people kill themselves? Or why, why would they end up with so much depression and so much more substance abuse and so much more stress in their lives? Is it that they're born this way? Or is it that they're trained this way? And here's what they've concluded, is that it's all a matter of training. Why? You train to find the little things. That's your gift. That's what you're skilled at. Like IT people. And I was talking to a CIO and I said, you know, you got to find people who can mentor you. And he said, Scott, we're IT. No one can mentor us. We're the best. <laughs> <laughs> but you can get some mentoring on letting go of some of the minutia. When I thought about this, this is a matter of training. And here's what Sean said. Sean said, these folks from the first class they attend, they are taught how to be more critical as opposed to accepting. From the first class they attend, they are taught how to find flaws with everyone else's reasons and everyone else's arguments but their own. And their success in school and in the jobs they get when they get out are based on them being the most anal and argumentative, not the least anal and argumentative. So isn't it possible that when those people leave the office where they have plaques all over their walls for being that way, that they don't turn it off when they walk through their door at home? Isn't it possible that they drive their partners crazy? That they drive their children crazy? They drive anyone else around who's not part of that high intensity critical environment crazy. It's like Jack McCoy on uh, Law and Order. No, any Law and Order fans? Love the guy, but his personality is pretty one dimensional, isn't it? Jack, what's important to Jack McCoy? Jack McCoy. He's going to win every time. That's a personality trait, which means if you can learn to be that critical, you can also then, on the other hand, learn how to let go. And I'm going to give you two suggestions. One of them comes from from uh, Martin Salvin, he says this, and each night before you go to bed, thinking of three things that went well that day, thinking of three things that you're happy about, thinking of three things that you'd like to see happen again. What that does is it reprograms your mind. It starts to reset the clock so that you're going to bed thinking about and dwelling on the right things, not the wrong things. It's interesting, a couple of weeks ago, I was frustrated with my little girls. Um, they're their bedtime behavior was getting on my nerves, but they're little. So it's like they get into bed and then realize, oh, I have to brush my teeth. You know that. I, I, and then they brush their teeth, they're in bed. Oh, I need lip chaps, chapstick. I need, I need hand cream. Oh, I need a drink of water. I need to go to the bathroom. It's like, did you just now discover that? So I was going for a run one morning, and I started thinking about my approach to it the night before was wrong. My approach was to focus on what they weren't doing right. Instead, I thought, you know what? I'm going to lay out the expectations one more time. And I posted on their bathroom mirror, here is the happy, Betty Ready schedule. Here are all the things that you have to do. And I ended it with, and then think of three things that you're grateful for. It's amazing, and maybe it's a coincidence, but the bedtime problems have been greatly diminished ever since then. And the other day, I was in the back office reading, and I heard one of them saying, and God, thank you for it. And I thought, wow. She's standing in front of the, the, the mirror, looking at the sign, and she's thinking of something to be grateful for because she's reading it, she's going through the motions. That's what Martin Solomon says you should do, is find reasons to be grateful. You don't have to go out of your way to find things to be miserable about, do you? You know, just get in traffic one day. Just have the air conditioner go out in July here in Tampa if you want something to be miserable about. But there are so many things that you could be positive about if you wanted to. And here's something you can try at work. This is something I do with my team. Uh, I, I dealt with a team, high visibility, high stress. Uh, what we started to do is we started to focus on every staff meeting was this, what's going well? Tell me what's going well. And what I started to do is started priming people to think of, share successes with the team and with Scott, not just the failures. That's a reprogramming. That's something that you condition yourself to do.